stuff. Like, frankly, I don't believe in the military industrial complex. We are the world's largest exporter of arms. Permission granted. Permission, permission granted. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> April, it's a Wednesday. That's weird, but it's good to see you. So weird. I know it was really <laughs> weird not doing a recap with you last week. It was so bizarre. We we did try, but my hotel internet was complete garbage. I couldn't hotspot. You were dropping in and out, and I said, you know what? Forget it. We will just have to skip on Friday. We'll come back Wednesday and do two this week. So that's what we're doing. Hello, mm -hmm. friends. It is really good to see all of you. I I have missed you dearly. It's very strange not doing a weekly recap, especially when you're at something yeah. that the whole world is watching. Um, so I'm thinking for this episode, it's a special TNE recaps. Actually, you know what? Let me go ahead and roll the stinger first. So we look real cool and official. Roll the stinger. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Uh, it's official now. It's official. I have to I, say I, I'm a little disappointed we couldn't record the recap because the world didn't get to see slightly disheveled Tim because you looked you looked tired. Did I? You looked you looked like you had been through some things. Well, I, I feel like I look disheveled usually. Like I wear the same solid t-shirts. My hair is barely combed usually. So it must you have looked, looked really more, bad. <laughs> more disheveled. <laughs> I, I, it was in a very intense trip. So here's what I want to do. I am working on like an official piece of content where I'm going to script it out and kind of go through all the details and kind of give my entire nitty gritty recap with all the B-roll, all the footage that I took, everything. I'm working on that. That takes time to make. Mm -hmm. What helps me is kind of processing what I went through with someone I know and trust who's also a great co-host. That's you. Oh, yeah, well... Hot yeah, dog. It was you. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why don't I just kind of brain dump some of my initial thoughts with you, April, and kind of go through what I saw. And then we'll come back, you know, in the future with, with, with the full on actual official piece of what uh, of, of my recap at the DNC. I think that's a swell idea, Tim. Wow. It's like we talked wow. about this before we started recording. <laughs> I think we did. Yes. So. OK. You had a hard time just getting to the DNC, right? Yeah, let's start there. Let, let, <laughs> let this is the stuff that will never make it in official recap because it's too blo right. it's too bloaty. I had the trip from hell. I have never had such a terrible mm -hmm. airport experience in my life. You know, we often say that does hell exist? We're not sure. No, I'm sure. Hell absolutely objectively exists and it exists in the Philadelphia airport mm -hmm. on Sunday. So here here was the original plan. The people that invited me to go with them, they booked my flight, which is great. I said, hey, listen, I do want to get there as soon as I can. I really can't leave Sunday afternoon because I have family time. I need a later flight or really early Monday morning. They go, okay, great. So they find me a flight, American Airlines, from 9 o'clock at night Sunday, to, and I would land at, at like 1030 in Chicago. Perfect. Full day with the family. I get to see them. I'm off. Perfect. So we're getting ready for a friend's, uh, it's their daughter's first birthday. It's the one-year-old birthday. So it's the big one. You don't miss those. So oh, I'm yeah, like, there's great. a smash can, cake. You can't miss that. All the stuff. And they're good friends of ours. Like we, we love them dearly. So I'm getting ready. I get a, a text notification at two o'clock. We are literally five minutes from getting in the car to go to this person's birthday party. I get a text from American Airlines. Your flight's been canceled. Please rebook. That's it. That That is the text. Like, no, we're sorry. No, hey, we found you a different flight. It is, your flight has been canceled. Open the app to see your options. I'm like, great. Never had this happen before to me. So I look, and my flight option is like 6.50, 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock. So I'm, I'm, talk, I'm trying to talk to Sarah. As she's getting ready. Like, Sarah, what should I do? Should I try and find a morning flight? I don't want to go in the morning because of rush hour. It's the DNC. Um, and so I'm thinking, okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do like, like this 650 flight. I refresh my screen. That flight's off the list. Can't do that. I'm like, oh my God. Ah. So essentially I tell Sarah and she, we agree, go to the earlier flight at like 350 is the departing time, which is me, which means Tim, you have to grab a, grab a lift now and go. So I'm like, okay. So I, my stuff is packed already. 
I kiss the kids, kiss Sarah, say, I'm so sorry. I have to leave now, but I got to go. I get to Philadelphia airport at three o'clock. I have pre-check, so right through TSA, which is great. I'm sitting in the terminal. And now my original flight, this is an important piece. My original flight was a direct flight. Mm. Philly to Chicago, straight. Perfect. Love it. My non-stop. new flight, my new flight is not nonstop. Now I'm mm. going from Philly to Knoxville, Tennessee to Chicago. Okay. Oh, that's why you text me and asked how far I am from yes. Knoxville. And then I ghosted you afterwards and I'll explain yeah, to you. Yeah, I was why. like, why? And then you never responded. <laughs> yeah, right. My bad. I've been doing that more. It's not a good habit. I have to get better no. at that. So I get to the airport, I'm sitting at the terminal. My the way the the, the original plan was you land at like six o'clock in knoxville your new flight leaves at 6 45 and you're in chicago by like 7 30 or no you're in chicago by like, like nine o'clock fine mm. my flight gets delayed in philly oh by like by like a half hour i'm like great That's now my doable. well it's doable but now my window for the, the catch my connecting flight is 15 minutes true so i was not land. not very big though I have to, okay, well, I, I don't I don't know that. So I'm like, I have to land and find my new terminal and get to my get, get to it. So it's getting closer and closer. Flight gets delayed again. Now I'm like ten minutes out. I'm like okay. So the screen says departs in five minutes, and I have a video of this. Maybe I'll put it on the screen uh, in post. And then I look at at the actual tarmac. There's no plane there. Like the plane mm. just is. I'm like okay, yeah, we're not leaving in five minutes. It was one of those scenarios. So I end up finally getting on the plane, and it's a real tight turnaround. And then I hear over the loudspeaker, "Uh, Hello, folks. They have spotted lightning on the tarmac. That will delay us by an additional 20 to 25 minutes. So sorry for the delay. At the same time, I get a text from American Airlines. We've moved your connecting flight to tomorrow because you're not going to make your existing one. And I'm like, the, the, the door is closed. To tomorrow? To tomorrow. The door is closed. I'm stuck in an aluminum or metal tube, and I'm going somewhere I have no reason to go to anymore. So I, I, I'm that guy. I ding the light. Ding. And the stewardess comes over. I, oh, also, I'm in the very back of the plane. Okay? There, there's no first class in the TNE world. I'm on the very, very I'm <laughs> the last row of this little, this little cylinder of, a, of an airplane. And um, I tell the stewardess, listen, I, my f- connecting flight is canceled. I'm going to miss it because of this delay. I have no reason to go to Knoxville. What can you do? And she was so nice. She's like, let me talk to the pilot. And they got management to get me off the plane. They actually reopened the door, which is a big no-no, but they, they did it for me. I got my bag. Okay, I'm back in Philly. Now I'm thinking, mm. what do I do? Do I go home and try and catch a morning flight? Um, what are my options? So now at this point, it's like it's like 5.30. So I've been here for like three and a half hours already. I'm, I'm getting mm. tired. I've already, yeah. eaten, I've, I've already eaten a meal. So there's nothing else to really do. So I mm. walk to like three terminals down. It's a huge airport to find the American Airlines customer service. There's a line out the wazoo and it is I'm not sure. moving. It's not moving. Uh, and uh. I'm like, I'm like, shoot, shoot. Uh. So then I start getting real creative. I'm texting my contact. Hey, my flight's delayed again. Oh my God, I can't believe it. So uh. I go, you know, I go, let, let, let me just check like Google flights and see if there's any other airline that's flying out of Philly tonight to Chicago. And lo and behold, like a dove descending ah. from heaven. Thank you. Frontier Airlines goes, hey, wow. Tim, it's we have clutch. a flight. We have a flight from that will leave at 9 o'clock or 8.30 and get you to Chicago by 10. Bingo. With the with like prime seating, it was 200 bucks. I'm like, done. Absolutely done. Take my money. I will take the first seat on the airplane Two hundred dollars. I book it on the spot. I cancel my American Airlines flight. I'm done with them. Do you okay. get the refund for your American Airlines flight? The p- p- the person who booked it, they got the refund. So good, which is fine. good. Okay, mm-hmm. just make it sure. But I'm like in the moment. I'm like two hundred bucks. Absolutely fine. So I booked the flight. Great. Now I have like three hours to kill. Okay. So I find sushi. You know, I I, I watch I, I watch a movie. Whatever. I, I I'm not sure about you, April. When I travel, I'm not getting work done. I am not in work mode. I have a hard time. Like I should work more on my book proposal. Like no, it's just not happening. So I'm watching like YouTube. I'm just trying to kill time. I get a text from Frontier Airlines. Your flight's been delayed. Oh. Your new takeoff time is now ten o'clock. I'm like ah. great. An hour delay. Not terrible. Only hour delay. Mm. I get to the terminal. It's delayed again. It's delayed ah. again. Ah. 
it's delayed again. Oh, now, really? now it's eleven o'clock at night. I'm watching oh. the Nickelback documentary on Netflix. I As have, one does. I'll, I'll, my, by the way, shameless plug. Great documentary. Highly recommend oh. it. So I'm sitting here at 11 o'clock. I've been in this airport now for nine hours, or eight, eight hours. And I don't know if this flight's going to get canceled because the, the notifications are like, um, due to labor laws, we your flight was delayed. Uh, due to a mechanical issue, your flight was delayed. So then it's like midnight. And we get told mm. on a loudspeaker, okay, your pilots are on a different flight coming here. They will then hop on this plane and bring you to Chicago. Everyone mm. claps. I mean, they literally, they literally go like this. Yeah, yeah. They literally clap, okay? Cool. Wow. Well, mm. 15 minutes goes by. Oh, no. A half hour goes by. Oh, no. It's now 1 o'clock in the morning. We have oh. no word on what's happening. It's 1 a.m. Mm. Um, I refresh like my ticket on the Frontiers app. It disappears, and I'm like, "What the heck just happened?" I'm like, "Do I not have tell so me." So much anxiety. Do not tell me this flight is getting canceled. Luckily, at like the eleventh hour, literally the the pilots walk and we see them head right towards the terminal or or towards our gate, and they get in the plane. I get on the plane. It's one forty in the morning, and we take wow. off for Chicago. I got there at 4 a.m. to my hotel room. Mm. No so, wonder you look disheveled. <laughs> you started it off like that. Right away, right away, God's judgment was all over me for going to the DNC, clearly. Yeah. So that was my trip getting there. I, I It was unbelievable. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I know that there's some people that are probably annoyed at how long it took you to tell that story because they just want to hear your recap from the DNC. But I think this is like this is part really, of it. <laughs> really putting people there. Like they I, I felt hope so. the frustration that you felt. You just wanted to get to the DNC too. Right. Yes. And yes. And so I got like five hours of sleep. And by the way, like that <laughs> previous weekend, I had I had music gigs, so I didn't get any sleep for the whole weekend. So I'm super tired. Yeah. I start yeah. getting like that scratchy throat feeling. I'm like, oh my god, am I getting Ugh. like under the weather because I'm so tired? That yeah. was annoying. I was okay. Like, I survived, but like it was just it was annoying. So yeah. So okay. I get there at 4 a.m. Sleep till about 9:30. And then here I am in Chicago at the so-called DNC. Um, that's that's how we kicked off. Yeah. Wow. But you did make it. I made it. And I made you it. were there yeah. all. Were you there all four nights? Yeah. So the way this this is what's also very interesting. I didn't realize how spread out this thing was. First off, the DN. Let's just start with from the beginning. The DNC is huge. Okay. This has happened. This happens once every four years. Everyone, every major Democrat, every major leader. P former presidents, current presidents, um, all kinds of media. It is huge. There's like, I think they said 50,000 people descended on Chicago for this thing. Wow. And everything is super spread out. So like the expo center where like your caucus meetings and like your, your booths are, that's three miles from my hotel mm. one way. And then the United center, which is where the actual like prime time stuff happens. That's three miles from the, from the expo center. So that's another uber trip so i took a lot of ubers a lot a lot of them but yes I, I i was there for every night we did get passes for every night the only night i skipped i did skip wednesday night i was just too tired and so i didn't go to the arena that night but i was there monday tuesday and thursday and i even had these passes so the way it works is you have to get passes for every night you can't you're not it's not just one ticket for the whole thing you have to get re-credentialed every single night and luckily our contact was able to get us pretty good passes every night so it was is it something you you buy like tickets or are they more um just like first come first serve based My, on your credentials i okay this is this is the part of the 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 world that i don't fully understand because i'm really on the faith side of this right now so much the political side my understanding is that i i i, I I don't know if you can buy them, but you have to have a connection to get you credentialed to get these passes. And there's mm. only so many. And the passes have different privileges on them, right? So, like, for example, I'm not sure if folks can see this, but, like, this one, if you can see that. Can you see that? It says yeah. hall. It says hall special guest, right? Mm -hmm. This one says arena guest. These are different levels of access. Ah. Okay? So, the arena gets you just – Okay, so there's a huge perimeter. The perimeter is massive. It is huge. And they funnel you into one small gate. Like It's it's the size of like a big door. 50,000 people are getting funneled there because of all the security. 
Yeah. Literally, they, they check your badge 10,000 times. But once you're in the perimeter, you're in the whole area, and then you can just walk wherever you want. The arena access gets you into the United Center, but not into the into the seating area. So essentially, you can walk the rings around the center as much as you want, right? You can do that, but you can't find a seat because you're not credentialed. This huh. orange, this yeah, and then so the way it works is there's three different levels of like access. So the hall special guest, which is the orange one, that's what I had, that gets you into the threes. So you you if you can find a seat in the three hundreds, that's the third level, mm. you're good. Then there's I think then there's like um honored guest, that's level two, then there's floor, and that's the floor. So you have to just have different kinds of connections to get you certain levels of access. Interesting. Yeah. So if you if you are just allowed in the arena but not in the actual auditorium, you just watch it from the screen, like on yes. the outside. Yes, but here's the crazy thing: it is like a beehive, and everyone's just walking around. So you meet a lot of people. It's like a, it's also a massive networking event. I mean, yeah. I'm walking around. There's Hassan Piker. There's Chenk from the Young Turks. You know, there's mm. uh, who's what's the guy's name? The the Jolly Ginger, the guy on Instagram mm. is always yelling. He's just walking around. You know, I, I see Kassan Rashid, a friend of mine. We start talking. Like it's 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 just it's just like that. So you mm. really could spend six hours just in the arena rings and be fine in fact i met charlie kirk there did i tell you that no charlie kirk was there charlie was kirk trying, was there is he in disguise like matt nope. walsh no or like mike lindell i ran into charlie kirk I, I i don't know if people know this publicly but there's a reason i'm allowed to go to turning point usa events and critique them and it's because i have enough of a relationship with some people on the inside that they know i'm a good faith actor so charlie knows who i am so I'm talking to one of the guys that I know in that world, and we're just kind of catching up. How, how's it going? And Charlie just walks over to me. Hey, man. I'm like, Charlie. And we shake hands, and we talk for a few minutes you know, about some stuff that's off the record. And I was like, man, what are you doing here? I was like, what are you doing at the DNC? So we talked for maybe like five or six minutes, but that that's just kind of how it is. Like you're just walking, and you just run into someone. And so yeah. so you could really be just in the arena and really be fine. Uh, and really be fine. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So what were, what were your, what was the thing that surprised you? Like, I'm sure you had expectations going into it, but was, was yeah. there anything that you weren't expecting that was just like, whoa, that's different. This is the hardest thing for me because what happens when you find some kind of common ground with a different political party than what you grew up with, right? In this case, right. the, Democratic National, the Democratic Party. But also you see some stuff where you're like, yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about this either, right? And so I find myself like in a lot of tension here. And this is going to be the hardest part to communicate when I actually write out the script and kind of get all my thoughts collected. Because when they say it's a big tent, that's like kind of the, like the language that people use inside the, DN, you know, the democratic um, uh, political world. It, it really is true. Like, okay, the RNC, when, what's his name? Is it, is, is it Tim Scott? Wait, wait, wait! Uh, the 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 black um, is he a congressman? Yeah. Tim, Tim Scott, Scott. I think, is it? sounds yeah. right. When, when when he spoke, it's clear that he's just being tokenized at the RNC, right? In the DNC, diversity is just like a fruit of who they are. Like it, they're not even yeah. trying. It just it just is who they are. All different kinds of people, all different ethnicities, races, disability. It's all there. It's all there. So it really was like shocking to see a truly diverse group of people coming around, you know, any political movement. That was really refreshing to me and seeing like like a, a, they had a panel for disability. They had a panel for Christian nationalism. It was very wide. What surprised me, though, was actually towards the end of the convention. On Thursday, like I was in the room uh, for because Harris was going to speak and give her acceptance speech. So we got seats really early. So I saw the whole thing. And, and by the way, what you see on TV is only a fraction of what actually goes on in the arena. Things start at like 5 o'clock. They start breaking out speakers and doing all kinds of different things. So it, there's a lot, a lot of programming. And as that night went on, it almost became more of like a moderate conservative platform. There were a mm -hmm. lot of like former military leaders and like defense secretaries and people boasting about how strong our military is. They had a cop on stage talking about having a strong police force. And I'm like, huh, like this is interesting for me because when it comes to empire and it comes to our military industrial complex, I'm not a huge fan. And I'm sitting next to Kassam Rashid. He's a human rights lawyer. I've had him on the podcast before. We're both just kind of like, this feels kind of odd, right? It feels kind of odd to have like this huge tent fighting in a lot of talk, a lot of talk around 
fighting for the marginalized and fighting for a more equitable America for the middle class, which I'm like, yeah, great, awesome. But then seeing like this like military industrial complex side still be deeply embedded in, in even the DNC was like a really weird p- pill for me to swallow. Like, what do I do with this? Right. Yeah. So that part to me was kind of surprising. And also, and we can talk about this now, there was some controversy, right, over the fact that there were no Palestinian Americans represented on the stage. Now, I want to kind of give some context to this. This is really important because there's a lot of things kind of floating around on the Internet about, like, what happened and what didn't happen. I was there. I sat in the middle of the – they're called the Uncommitted Movements press conference. Let me kind of give people some of the nuance here. There were a, there were definitely protests outside of the of all the secured areas. I saw several of them, and they were they felt big to me. Tons of cops, tons of people protesting, calling Harris, you know, killer uh, Kamala, that kind of stuff. Like, very intense imagery, right? For sure. That is not the same group of people that that were credentialed and were able to gain access to the arena who were called the Uncommitted Movement. The Uncommitted Movement is actual Democrats. They're actually party leaders. They're delegates in their state. They're not anarchists. They're not far left. They're not any of those things. They are working within the Democratic Party. Okay, so these are mm-hmm. insiders. And essentially, their their, their request was, look, we're, you say you're a big tent. We believe in the big tent. We believe in a Harris-Walsh presidency. We're, we want them to be in office. We're asking to have a Palestinian representation on the same stage that you're giving such wide representation to of other people groups, including a Jewish family whose son, I believe, is being held hostage in Gaza, as they should have. I'm glad that they that they amplified that voice. Why would you not amplify in your big tent, in, in your party, a voice advocating for the, the ceasefire, right, of of uh, of what's happening between Israel and Israel? in Gaza. Party wants to hear this, but the party leadership has not heard this request. And my ask is why? Why are we not building this tent to be bigger? Why are we not doing this? Because I want to win in November. And that means we build a bigger tent. Why can't we hear from a Palestinian American on stage? Because that would show people that we want to build a bigger tent. As someone who does not want to see a Trump presidency, I want to win, and that means building that bigger tent so we can win. That means getting a ceasefire and an arms embargo because that's what the majority of Democrats want. All the lowest bar we can set is asking for a Palestinian American to speak. That yeah. was that felt really off putting to me, frankly. And it's not about it's not about this like anarchist, you know, outside the DNC protest. These, these are different people, but their approach was very clear. It was like, look. We just want to be able to give a pre-approved speech by the DNC to say we're here, we're committed to this, and we want to find a ceasefire. And by the way, they had a lot of support. Big unions tweeted out that 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 they wanted to see a Palestinian voice on the stage. Um, I'll, uh, uh, some Jewish people said the same thing. So that part to me was also disappointing. Um, were they ever on the the schedule? Like, was it? Were they asking to be platformed for a while? Or, and were they taken off or yeah. was it? Yeah. Cause My I know under- I saw like yeah. during the week people calling for it and I didn't under, I didn't understand why they weren't given. Cause I saw someone share what the speech would have been from the uncommitted yeah. um, movement. And yeah. it seemed totally still in line with what Kamala Harris herself has called for. I, I like, and for me as an outsider too, I didn't understand why they wouldn't have been given a platform has it has the dnc or the democratic party made any kind of statement on why um, they didn't as of this recording i'm not aware of any official statement of why they didn't my understanding is that they were is that, is that the uncommitted movement was in talks for weeks with the dnc to make something happen just to get again not not a ton of voices not um a big banner saying ceasefire now they just wanted to be essentially a, a, one way of putting it is they just wanted to be part of the convention, right? They're Democrats, they believe in what's happening, and they want to be represented for their cause, which, by the way, inside the party felt very popular to me. I even talked to a few insiders, one in particular, who's run several major campaigns. I was sitting next to her for a little bit, and she's like, yeah, I don't understand this move by the DNC not to give a Palestinian voice on this platform. It feels incredibly unpopular. Now, that being said, one thing I learned going here is that the DNC, like the RNC, is a massive political organization with tons of money, tons of money. 
I don't know where it comes from, but my guess is that they have some big time strategists who are looking at all the numbers and all the data and what's popular and what's not. And that's kind of their guiding star in order to win the election. That's my best guess. It is totally a guess. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that part was a bit of a bummer. I'm not going to lie. You know, it was kind yeah. of discouraging. Um, and I think that, though, one of the differences, because I, I can imagine people being like, well, Tim, like, you know, we still have to vote, you know, for the Harris Walsh ticket. Like, don't be don't be too negative. You vote however you want. You vote your conscience. I totally get that. I'm not saying that you can't or that you shouldn't. I'm not even saying that, like, both sides are equal in this case. One thing that I appreciate is that the uncommitted movement got credentialed. It was able to be there. They, they, they did a sit-in protest inside the arena during the convention. So, if anything, yes. I mean, the, the Democratic Party is more willing to at least hear dissenting voices, which I really appreciate. But, again... I feel like as Christians, especially if we're going to say as new evangelicals that we always want to advocate for those on the fringe, those that fall through the cracks, the marginalized, because our yeah. allegiance is to Jesus. I just felt I felt an immense sense of solidarity with those people on the outside trying to get access to the halls of power that could help be part of a permanent ceasefire and potential, you know, like arms embargo with the Israeli military. Yeah. From an outside perspective, before I realized because I didn't know that they weren't that they were denying a request for the uncommitted movement to speak while I was watching like the first few days. But I did notice several of the speakers bring up Palestine and Gaza and calling for a ceasefire. And yep. I thought um, uh, Senator Warnock, his yes. speech was very powerful. Uh. I need my neighbor's children to be OK so that my children will be OK. I need all of my neighbor's children to be okay. Poor inner city children in Atlanta and poor children of Appalachia. I need the poor children of Israel and the poor children of Gaza. I need Israelis and Palestinians. I need those in the Congo, those in Haiti, those in Ukraine. I need American children on both sides of the track to be okay. Because we are all So and good. I was thinking, because he was a minister, and I was comparing his speech to, which granted, he's a senator, so it's a little different than the RNC platforming Franklin Graham, who is <laughs> just a minister. But I was I was comparing the two in my head. And Franklin Graham, if you remember, it was just very, he was talking about Trump's character, oddly enough, um, and about how he, Trump was protecting Christian rights and protecting kind of like yeah. their belief system. And then you had Senator Warnock who was just praying for the children of everybody. And it was yeah. just, it was much more like not about rights. It was about people. Yeah. And that, that seemed to be a, just a very night and day difference. Cause so much of the RNC was really just about Trump and and not that pe obviously people talked a lot about Kamala and, and her credentials and everything, but it, it seemed much more based on a common idea of shared humanity and equality uh, yeah. uh, for people, yeah. um, which is why, you know, them not platforming a Palestinian voice is, is disappointing because that was yes. their whole message. Yes, yes, um, exactly. But it did see beyond that, most voices seem to be included. No doubt about that. I mean, they're... they're it def the approach is so different, and I was not at the RNC. I watched it like all like all of us did on on, on TV. But the 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 broad stroke difference is that one party seems very concerned about maintaining their power and privilege, and making it an us versus them, right? Like uh, yeah. mass deportation now, save America, take America back. That was not the language at the DNC. The language, now the actions could be different. But let's just say the language was much more about we the people, much more we as a collective of people for all of our neighbors, um, you know, fighting for workers' rights for all of our, our all of the middle class, right? Thinking about, about all of our children in, in America, thinking about how we, we kind of push everyone up, so to speak. So the approach was definitely very different. And here's the interesting thing, here's the interesting thing about faith. There's kind of two sides to this. Because you're right, from the stage, I definitely heard a decent amount of people invoking some sense of faith. Now, it was very different, right? Because the RNC, 
it just seems like it's embedded that, that that this is a primarily white Christian identity that's kind of running things. And so you use all that language of, you know, um, of, of family values and you know, biblical worldview. That's not the language being used here at all. But people still invoke their faith, like, um, like Warnock, for example. However, I did speak to several people, journalists, insiders on the DNC. I spoke to the folks from Evangelicals for Harris. I, I spoke to all kinds of folks. And I did hear a lot of talk of how it is hard for faith people to get recognized inside uh, like the actual like DNC leadership and structure, like how it's hard for, for, for them to have their voices heard. Not in the sense of we're advocating for our rights, more of we want to help be part of the change, but because we're Christians, we're kind of snubbed a little bit. We're kind of looked down upon. And I heard that mm -hmm. from multiple sources on the inside. So again, I'm just calling, I'm telling people what I heard from people who have been in this world much longer than I have. But there is at least at a minimum a perception that, you know, people, especially on the top or at the top of the DNC, really aren't like major, either people of faith, they don't really understand faith, or they're even a little bit hostile to faith, even when it comes into more progressive form. So I thought that was very interesting. I wonder if some of that is almost because an aversion to how hyper faith focused yeah. the right yeah. is, you know, like right. I have a version uh, an aversion to Christian nationalism. So I, I'm like, I don't want to be like, Oh, only true Christians would vote for a Democrat. Like, I don't want to be the, just the other side totally. of the same coin, totally. you know? Um, 100%. and, and when you're taking a big 10 approach, you can't be seen to be elevating one belief system over another, totally. not, not saying it's right or anything, but I think, my concern is that here's my concern i don't think that many people who are leading the dnc on the high level like i'm talking about like some of the big names and people who you might never hear of who make a lot of decisions mm -hmm. i don't think they really understand what is driving the MAGA movement i don't think that they understand christian nationalism I don't think they know names like Doug Wilson or RJ Rush Dooney or Lance Wallnow. I don't think they know any of those names. And because of that, I feel like the DNC is missing a huge opportunity because what they don't realize is that there are a lot of people, and you and I are part of this, who grew up in that conservative evangelical framework, have left it behind still hold on to our faith, but are looking for a new place to call home with how we engage in our political discourse, right? So if I was a, D a democratic strategist, which I'm not, but if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm thinking about that, I'm like, guys, to speak evangelicalese, the harvest is plenty. You know, like you have mm -hmm. a massive group of people who are just looking to call a new yeah. place home, to engage in, in a political um, discourse and policy that advocates for all their neighbors who can also help you understand better than anyone what actually motivates the MAGA movement, right? And so that's kind of my concern is I'm afraid in the name of maybe maybe just ignorance and maybe pride and ego and, and, and also not understanding religion or religious people, they could be missing out on a real opportunity to understand the Christian militant fundamentalism that yeah. motivates and animates not Trump, but the people behind Trump, the people shaping Project 2025, you know, Turning Point USA, right? Like what's shaping Charlie Kirk? Why is Doug Wilson speaking at Turning Point Faith events? Because of the religious fundamentalism that animates all of it. That's what concerns right. me. Yeah, I think it kind of goes back to, we, we talked about this at, on some episode, I don't remember which one, <laughs> but um, abortion, I think is a huge issue for yes. a, a good chunk of conservative Christians and even moderate, maybe right leaning Christians who don't like Trump and don't want to vote for Trump, but don't feel like they can vote for a Democrat because of the abortion issue. And I'm, I wanted to ask you too, I saw a lot of right wing talking heads talking about how they were murdering babies at the DNC, you know, quote unquote, um, because there was a planned parenthood bus, I guess, outside of the DNC that were, uh, I, what I read is they had, they were giving abortion pills and free vasectomies to people who wanted it. Where, did you see that bus at all? So I did not see that bus. Here is the story behind that. There was a Planned Parenthood bus a few blocks away from the DNC. It was not sponsored by the DNC. Planned Parenthood is not listed as an official sponsor of the DNC on any of their literature. Now, in the Expo Center, 
there was the Planned Parenthood, is it, I think the Action Fund or Action Committee, which I think is kind of like their political arm. So there was, Planned Parenthood was in some capacity there at the Expo Center. But that bus was not like a DNC-sponsored idea of like, there wasn't a, a meeting of, of Democratic strategists saying, you know what, let's get a Planned Parenthood bus right next to the United Center to do this. They did that on their own accord and were funded by a whole different audience. That being said, I do want to be very clear. This idea that, you know, they were just murdering babies only makes sense if you believe in the propaganda that pro-life and abolitionists throw at you. In re reality, they were giving away um, medication that could induce abortion, which means it was a pretty early on pregnancy, and we don't know why that person got pregnant, and they were, I believe, handing out or, or setting, setting up appointments for vasectomies. So yes, that part is true. That was a thing. But again, the notion that, you know, well, the, the DNC was just murdering children in the name of freedom is such a twisted view of what actually happened. Yeah, which I think is one thing that a lot of like evangelicals for Harris or the people that le left Republicanism and are trying to find a home in the Democrat Party, they could be a good voice to help Democrats reach that. Because when I was deeply, deeply, deeply conservative and very anti-abortion, I literally believed that they were just like decapitating babies because you believed this like that, that that women were carrying babies to full term and basically just like murdering them at nine months pregnant, which is not a thing, but that's what the right always talks about. And I think it would be very smart if the Democrats actually want to reach a lot of these people who do not want to vote for Trump, but feel like they can't vote for a Democrat is to actually explain I one, agree. what, what abortion actually is. Cause most people do not know. And yep. then two, just the the nuance around the like the lies and the misinformation like i feel like so many democrats are just focusing on well it's a woman's right to choose they should choose literally a republican hears that and think oh you're just saying it's a woman's right to murder her baby at nine months that, that's, that's what right. they hear that's right they, like there needs to be just some more nuance of like hey we want to lower abortion rates too. No one just loves having high abortion rates, but here's how we lower abortion rates with, a, you know, a comprehensive sex education, with um, access to birth control, like easy, yep. free access to birth control, with um, better uh, family care and, and leave when people get pregnant, with child care, with like all of these other programs that Republicans are typically against. Like laying that out, like, because there, there's just this narrative in right wing spaces that Democrats love abortions, yep. that it's like, yep. like they do yep. it for fun. Like there's there's women out there who just get pregnant just so they can kill a baby, like right. they get off right. on it. Like, like people literally believe that. And I, they're, they're just need, they, there just needs to be a counter narrative to that. And I still haven't really seen them try. I completely agree. Let me show you guys something here. I'm going to pull this in in the moment here. Uh, there we go. Look at this graph. Really helpful to see this. Mm -hmm. Estimated number of abortions provided into the formal health care system in the United States, 1973 through to, through 2023. Once you hit the the like beginning of the 90s, you see abortion rates drop precipitously all the way through, mm -hmm. really until Trump, and then Roe v. Wade gets overturned, and then the projected data, abortion rates go back up. Right. And this is what I don't get, because to be clear, the DNC, especially on Thursday, really tried to court Republicans. They had Adam Kingsinger speak. Adam Kingsinger was voted with Trump like 90 something percent of the time. But he spoke giving his support behind Harris because of the insurrection. Right. It, it, and also the military, the police presence like on the stage. It was clear to me. And also they handed out American flags. I've never seen so many American flags in my life. I've never seen so many chants of USA, USA in my life. <laughs> It was clear that that the DNC wanted America to know that they are pro-America, they love their country, they are all about the moderate kind of vibe, etc. 
why you would not start showing the data that actually abortions dropped the most through the Obama presidency more right. than through Reagan or Bush, right? Who's actually pro-life by that, by, by, by that metric, yeah. right? We have the data on this and we can see the, the projected, now we don't have the final numbers yet, but the projected numbers of abortions are poised to go up after Roe v. Wade was overturned. And this is one of the mm -hmm. big things that I think people should be hammering home. And I'm actually working on more content to cover this. The pro-life hardline ban abortions everywhere movement actually causes maternal and paternal um, um, mortality rates to go up. Yep. To go up. Infant mortality rates and maternal mortality rates go up. Look at Texas. They went up by 62%. Yep. So these these bans are, do not actually do the thing that these people say it does, right? We know what lowers what I call are unnecessary abortions, meaning abortions that aren't happening because of like a fetal demise issue or like a health issue, right? Or something like that. But like, but, th but that they could have been prevented by having ac access to contraceptives or better access to healthcare or a livable wage, et cetera. So we know what actually lowers these rates. And if you look at the data, through Democratic presidents, they got lowered the most. So we're right. actually believing propaganda when we think that right-wing people want to reduce the number of abortions. They actually don't because their their policies don't actually do that. Right. Well, you, it's, it's the difference of you want to make abortion illegal as opposed to making abortion unnecessary. Exactly. Bingo. Which Bingo. just making it illegal doesn't make it go away. And what they've done is they've done a really good job at creating this narrative that people who want to get abortions just want to kill kids. That is just not yeah. the reality. Again, the data no. shows us we cover this many times. So anyway, but to your point, no. I agree, April, a huge opportunity, we can call it, a huge blind spot would be to actually reclaim the narrative of why this happens. Now, they did in some ways. For example, they had Kate Cox. She uh, had a national yeah. story you know, um, about her a few months ago because her – Fetus had trisom trisomy, I think that's how you say it, 18, which is pretty much a, a literal death sentence. Uh, infants rarely, if ever, survive that. Um, and so she couldn't get access to an abortion, um, even though it was causing all kinds of health complications in Texas. She had to go outside the state. So she was there. She spoke for a minute. So there was some of that. But yeah. I agree. The framing of why this happens, right? right? It's not really clear. It's more about just... Right to choose. That's our platform. I get it. But man, give the people some context. Combat the propaganda you see from this far right pro life movement that tries to own this. It's murder. It's not true. Right. Right. And I and I totally I am a hundred percent on women's bodily autonomy for anyone's bodily sure. autonomy. Sure. Hundred percent. Um but that, that narrative just doesn't work when you're talking about people who have only heard a sensationalized view of Completely abortion, if you're agree. trying to get their point of view. Okay, I want to shift gears a little bit because I feel like all we've done is poo-poo on the DNC. Um, <laughs> and and so negative. To, to say some positive things is I, so, so a couple of my favorite moments, I'm curious if you saw them or not. Um, when Joe Biden spoke that first night and everyone cheered for him for like, I don't know. It was like over three minutes. It was insane. Yeah. And yeah. and when he hugged his daughter and like teared up, like it made me tear up. There's something For sure. just genuinely beautiful about just seeing you could see the love that that he and his daughter had for each other. And then just the room had for him. Yes. And, yes. You know, because he there did. Was, he he let yeah. he literally he's leaving a place of power. Right. To, so Kamala can walk in. And that's. There was a ton of gratitude for Joe Biden. I mean, a ton. They had signs. Yeah. They were chanting, thank you, Joe. Every night, at some point, there was a thank you, Joe kind of thing. Many speakers thanked uh, President Biden for his service. And listen, let's, let's, be, let's be for real. He's a career civil servant. He's served for like decades you know in all in all parts of the of the political body and that's important you know so yeah i agree and, and listen i don't want to sound like a like the ultra negative nancy that isn't my point there was a lot of positive here i love the speeches i heard so little blatant dehumanizing from from the stage yeah. so little of like the demons and the deep state and you know those crazy conservatives are just are so out of control we hate them it was that was not the tone yeah. There were very fair critiques. There was the whole weird thing, which, which, which we covered before. But the critiques were all incredibly valid. Like, they actually had the receipts, right? And yeah. so the, the overall tone seemed much more of an attempt to come across as, 
look, we want to govern for all Americans. We want everyone's yeah. wages to go up. We want everyone to have affordable health care. We want yeah. everyone to have the same access to opportunity, right? Not the same outcome. This is one of the big things I hear from right wing. You know, Democrats, they just want, uh, you know, um, the same outcomes for everyone. It's like, no, they want people to have the same opportunities. Right. Big difference, right? They want yeah. to make sure that, that 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 some of those barriers that people have that other folks don't are erased, so there's the same access to the the so-called American dream, right? So there's a lot yeah. of talk about that, a lot of strong union presence, a lot of unions saying yeah. we're behind this administration, we 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 fight for for the working class, etc. And so I thought that was really powerful. You know, like I definitely felt more inspired listening yeah. to people at the DNC than I do going to Turning Point America Fest or the RNC or something like that. Well, and, and one thing that I noticed, too, especially with with both Michelle and Barack Obama's speeches, but a lot of people, too, they they critiqued Trump. They critiqued like MAGA with valid critiques. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they did not dehumanize Republicans like mm -hmm. your average American that wants to vote for Trump. Right. They, they acknowledged that they were scared they ignore but but they were like we have this shared humanity we have more in common than we have different and yep. i just thought that was just a night and day difference from the rnc where the rnc was just demonizing democrats like we were just the scum of the earth that we were pure evil that they or you know we i'm, I'm technically registered a democrat but that's only oh, because no. I, <laughs> that's only because i have to vote for a in the primary, you have to register in Kentucky. Yes, that makes sense. And I just couldn't do I I couldn't do Republican. I just couldn't do it. But anyway, um, but they just were very much more welcoming of, of the other side and wanting to reach out. And that is just not something you hear from the Republican side. Just like not even an attempt to understand. No, I, I we need to call this out. Here's one of the biggest differences that we can, we can discuss and that it should be pointed out. And again, I'm, I'm hopefully folks can understand why it takes long to actually write these things out because there's so many layers to all of this, right? At the DNC, President Biden spoke, former President Obama spoke, yeah. former President Clinton spoke, Hillary Clinton, who ran for president, spoke. You had four either nominees or presidents speak at the DNC. At the RNC, just Trump spoke. There was no Bush yeah. and Mitt Romney was nowhere to be found. And that's because the RNC is the party of Trump. Yeah. The RNC has been taken over. Lara Trump, I think that's his daughter-in-law, runs the RNC now. She's the chair of the RNC. Recently, RFK, who's a conspiracy theorist and who has not denied sexual abuse allegations from his former babysitter, okay, has partnered with Trump and now people like Charlie Kirk are calling it the unity party. It is night and day what's happening. When you have Adam King's and also many other former former Republicans and governors speak at the DNC. I think two I did, I think I read today about 200 former staffers for Bush and all those former conservatives have sided with Harris in this election cycle. They they, yeah. they wrote a statement endorsing Harris. There is a massive shift happening. And I think if I'm being honest, the concern for some of the more progressive Democrats is that they're afraid that this shift is going to make the Democratic Party more moderate in how it governs and how it approaches mm. things, right? And I think there's concern because they're thinking, okay, no Palestinian voices, um, yeah. a lot of cops on stage, military on stage, bragging about the size of our military. These aren't like really progressive values, you know, in in in, in, yeah. in the sense of like of how we think about this stuff. So I think that that there is some concern now that the tent has gotten big, but it's maybe gotten so big in one direction that's going to pull the whole party towards a more moderate, uh, even right. conservative neocon kind of view, because Trump and his party are now so far right. Right. So I, I that's more me just opining on that. I don't have like hard data, but that's kind of the sense I get when it comes to the, the current state of the Democratic Party. Well, and it kind of I kind of feel that way, too. It seems like the Democrats like we're not going to like they, they just have to be the adult in the room almost like they can't really do the things that maybe they want to do or that maybe yeah. the majority of their platforms are because they just have to be the adult in the room while the republicans are flirting with fascism right 
Right. And it, it kind of is almost like survival of democracy type thing where you're just in survival mode. It's like, yeah, we do want to do all those things, but we can't because we have to just save democracy. Um, which I, I, I don't think that's not, that's not a not valid take, but right. also right. it's disappointing when you're wanting to move, you know, if you're someone that wants to move the country. Well, let me give you an example. More progressive. I mean, I think that, that this is like another um, example of people getting super concerned. Uh, is this the right video? Yeah. So the uh, Democrats omit call to abolish the federal death penalty from their 2024 party platform. This has been in the party platform for a long time. It, in 2016, huh. the Democratic Party became the first major political party in the U.S. to call for an end to capital punishment in its platform. And a decade later, now it's out. It's not in there anymore. Right. So I wow. think that, that that there are people and honestly, look, I'm going to be honest, April, I kind of find myself more with the with those folks who look and they go mm, like, I'm not sure I feel about some of this stuff. Like, frankly, I don't believe in the military industrial complex. We are the world's largest exporter of arms all over the yeah. place. We send bombs all over the place. Like as a Christian, I'm opposed to that for sure. I'm absolutely opposed to not abolishing the death penalty. 100%. Yeah. So I find myself, and I guess you can call me a radical, but I find myself, because of my allegiance to Jesus, way more in, in, in the in the camp of, like, we need to get a ceasefire done. We have to stop funding the Israeli military industrial complex that's killing children. Like, that's that to me is not radical. That's a humanitarian crisis that I think Christians should mm -hmm. be all about, right? Or especially people like ourselves. So I definitely see the concern that some folks have. I think the 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 positive though is that the DNC is willing to kind of house all of those people and say, well, yeah, you're still welcome here. We have to reason together to find that better path forward. But right. man, I mean, at what cost and how long will it take? Yeah. I think is the major question. Yeah, I think there's there's still this tendency to have this black and white thinking when yeah. it comes to this stuff. Where I, I I've seen a lot of people mad of some people critiquing the DNC or it's like uh -huh. now is not the time to critique, totally. you totally. know, be quiet, bigger thing. Like almost like it, it's giving like mega church, protect the ministry <laughs> vibes, you know, <laughs> where it's like, okay, but we can still support the ministry and also call out the harm that it's causing. Yeah. When you, you know, like, like I, like I don't, I think you can critique Kamala and you can critique the Democrats and still admit that Trump would be terrible for the country. You know, like two things can be true at the same time. It like Kamala can still be the better option, but still she's not perfect. I'm going to give my hot take on this. I, I know no matter what, I'm going to get an email or a DM <laughs> or, or a comment. And that's fine. To be clear, we welcome opposing views. You don't have to side with me on, on everything to be part of the community. That, that's not how this works. I find myself in tension because on one hand, as you know, I truly find Christian nationalism to be the single greatest threat to democracy that we face in our lifetime for all yeah. kinds of reasons. Project 2025, the world of Doug Wilson, your Sean Foyts, the turning points of the world. We see what they're advocating for. We know how, how it affects our neighbors. It is horrible. It's terrible. Most of my time is spent critiquing and exposing those things, right? I know probably more than most just how bad this stuff is. Like, I know. And so I completely understand the allergy to critique the other political party, right? Because of what's happening in this far right takeover of the RNC that I would argue is fascist in nature. When you're cozying up to authoritarian folks like Viktor Orban in Hungary and he's shaping some of your policy, like it's a red alert. Yeah. It's a red alert. I get that. I know why this election is so important. And hopefully people who follow our work can see that we're doing our best to give people permission to think differently about how they engage politics this election cycle. Okay. I also understand that between a Harris Waltz administration or a Trump administration, I know which one would be maybe by a razor's edge, but would be better on Palestine, Israel, meaning they would actually at least advocate for a ceasefire. They would hopefully try and get something done. They would at least acknowledge the suffering of the Palestinian people. That's way different than we should drop nukes on them, which some GOP folks have advocated for. So I get that. However, 
I also understand that the Biden administration has sent billions of dollars in weapons to the Israeli military that have been used on civilians in Gaza. I don't think we understand the level of decimation that the Palestinian people have faced in the past almost year now. 40 plus thousand people dead, like 70% of the Gaza Strip obliterated. Tens yeah. of thousands of, of uh, explosive devices dropped on civilians. You can't, there's no healthcare access. The hospitals have collapsed. People are dying of famine. I mean, talk to my friend Daniel Bonanora, you know, a Palestinian Christian who, have, who I've had on the podcast many times and will have on again. The suffering is unimaginable. It is unfathomable what they're going through. And as Christians, we have to be that squeaky wheel. We have to t speak to power, even power that, that we think might be better than the other power. We still have an obligation to speak truth to that power and say, absolutely not. Please be consistent. Right? If you're going to spend 35 hours in a week, yeah. you know, five hours a night or whatever it is, six hours a night, talking about fighting for the marginalized and the middle class and the, and the disabled and our BIPOC neighbors and our queer neighbors, please add the plight of the Palestinians into this, considering that the U.S. is one of the biggest supporters of the nation who is dropping these bombs on children. So I truly understand the both and, and I understand that tension. I understand how folks are going to are gonna take some pretty hard line sides on either of that. I get that. For me, I just feel myself very much stuck because I understand the pragmatic. I think it's clear pragmatically what we have to do. And I think if a Harris Waltz administration takes place, we have an obligation, especially as Jesus people, to petition them 24-7, 365 to help end the suffering of the Palestinian people. That's kind of yeah. how I see it. Yeah. Well, I think if anything, it just further shows that we really need rank choice voting <laughs> <laughs> eventually. Get rid of the two party system because you get yeah. locked in with political party ideologies. And, you know, because at the end of the day, we could, the, the, gov the Democrats can be the people that are quote unquote like fighting the man and speaking truth to power and trying to break down systems, but they are also that system. Yeah. No, ex you know. ex that's a great way of putting it. That's exactly right. I, I am working yep. on getting uh, a guest on the podcast to help us understand our political system when it comes to voting and how it works and why a third party yep. never gets anywhere. So I'm working on hoping to give people some education there because I'm still trying to learn myself. But yeah, I mean, these are some of like kind of my initial thoughts on, on what I experienced. It was, it was, I was honored. It was so cool being around people. It was great just seeing. Oh, that's the New York Times. Oh, that's Mother Jones. Like just talking to those folks and. Frankly, I was humbled that I got recognized many times by people just walking around saying, thank you for the work you're doing. I was like, wow, that that gave me a lot of fuel. Like, OK, like the work yeah. that we're doing at TNE as an organization with you and me, April, on the podcast, like people see it. I had someone who's a journalist who I really respect and admire tell me he watched my interview with Lisa Sharon Harper and loved it. He thought it was shot really well. The conversation was great. And I'm like, oh my God, like you watched my stuff. I'm humbled and honored. So that was positive too. It was really cool to come away thinking like, okay, you know, the work that we're doing is recognized and people really find it helpful. So that was very motivating as well. Yeah. Were you in the room when Lil John gave the roll call I was for not. Georgia? I was ah, not. I was that not. That would be my favorite moment. I, I love not. seeing the side by side <laughs> of the roll call yeah. at the RNC versus the DNC. That I mean, funny. you got to admit the joy. I mean, I wasn't in the room, but it just seemed like that there was a lot of joy, a lot of excitement that people were just happy. I mean, this is it's it. I've seen a lot of people say that it feels similar to 2008 when Obama first ran, which I can't relate to because right, I right, right, right. Thought maybe right. he was the Antichrist. Right. Yeah, I thought he was going to um, destroy the country. You know, I no, I felt no no joy then. <laughs> I know. Like, if anything, I, I'm curious if you felt this way too. I am, I am consistently sad that I couldn't enjoy Obama's presidency. Which, granted, he he wasn't perfect by any means. For but sure. I believed all the right wing lies about him that he was bringing socialism, totally. that he was a terrorist, totally. that he was not an American. The birth, like, ah. Uh, you it's know what's crazy? I, yeah. crazy? First off, I agree. I tweeted that, actually, and it, it went viral. So I'm like, I'm, I feel so robbed that like I, yeah. I believe these lies. Here's one other interesting tidbit. For all the talk of pro-family in the RNC, all I saw from the DNC were committed marriages. 
I saw Michelle and Brock on stage. Yeah, they were hugging each family. other. Right, Tim Jill, Wall Jill and Gus. Right, that, right. Oh, that was like, so beautiful. I was like, oh, they're these are pro these are families that actually care about each other. Like like Melania didn't even speak at the RNC. She barely even like stood up. You know, it was clear. It, yeah. We all know. We all know that Trump and Melania do not have a good relationship. So different. So allegedly. Different. Allegedly. Sorry. Allegedly. <laughs> We don't. So different no, than what no. I saw at the DNC overall when it came to, um, I mean, e even Hillary and Bill Clinton. Which I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about Bill Clinton being platform there because of what he did to Monica Lewinsky. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say that out loud. I have a lot of thoughts on that. I wasn't really a huge fan, but like, you know, Hillary was was in the room for his speech, supporting yeah. him, cheering him on. I'm just saying, like, that was interesting to me. So I, I think April, I did, I felt a lot of the joy. I did. And I don't want to be pessimistic, but there was kind of a gray cloud over the whole thing with the Palestinian voices not being on the platform. I think if they yeah. just had one person give a five-minute speech just advocating for what we all want, I think I would have been like, you know, I would take off my shirt yeah. and just would have said DMC on the front. Like, I'm all in. Like, I'm in. I believe in this. But without that, it just – there was it was really positive. I don't want to minimize yeah. it. It was so refreshing compared to the spaces I've been in historically that are not like that. But there was just a gray cloud over the whole thing knowing yeah. that these people were just asking to have a seat at the same table, you know, um, that are part of the party. They're not on yeah. the outside. They're not radicals. Radicals term used loosely. But, you know, they're, they're not like that. They are Democrats who love their party who just want to see at the table. That part was tough for me, but overall yeah. it was a positive experience. Did you see any of the Christian protesters or proselytizers? I, I sat right in front of them. So Kristen Dumay was there. Yeah, she wrote Jesus, ah. Jesus and John Wayne. We hung out the whole day. It was so cool. I was like fanboying the whole time. And she was so mm -hmm. awesome. So we're stuck in line in that in that like in that choke point to get inside the arena. And right there are those protesters preaching, you know, God hates they don't use the word homosexual. Let's just put it that way. They use much more mm -hmm. dehumanizing language. And me and Kristen and Lisa Sharon Harper were just sitting in line, stuck for a half hour, listening to their bullhorn right in our ear. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. I yeah. saw um, uh, an Instagram reel. Cause I, I don't think Instagram knows my algorithm because I get served <laughs> a lot of the like really conservative Christian stuff. Maybe because I, you know, satire, satirize it, satirize it, satirize it's it. Yeah, sure. Let's I make satire, that. whatever. Yeah. Um, but there's some there's some group called Chicago for Jesus or Jesus for Chicago. I don't know. It's some like Christian group in Chicago. And they were they had a lot of videos of them like, you know, quote unquote, witnessing to people at the DNC, because obviously there's no Christians that could be going there. Obviously. Um, and uh, they had this one video that was really annoying to me. They were showing this guy who was waving a free Palestine flag. Okay. And they were like, this guy was following us around, waving his free Palestine flag. Like, like it was just like this ominous thing. They didn't say it, but the way that they were treating it, like this guy clearly needs to get saved. And then they're like, but later he let us pray for him and look at what God did. It just like really was rubbing me the wrong way that like somehow Jesus couldn't be on the side calling for a free palace. I don't know. Anyway, the, I saw lots of videos thing, like that. The last <laughs> thing I'll say, and I, I'll, um, yeah, the last thing I'll say is, is at the very end, Thursday night, after Harris spoke, all the balloons dropped, we walked out, and we hit, like, the gauntlet of every protester for every cause at the same time and had oh to get gosh. escorted by police. So it was your pro-Palestine you know, Palestine protesters with their bullhorn and, like, a drum. There was what they call our progressive pro-lifers, which really is, like, progressive anti-choicers. They were there hmm. yelling at us for being part of the pro-death cult. Then you had your like Jesus people also yelling at us and protesting, and it was all in one place in like a fifty foot walk. You're just getting bombarded with like ten thousand mm. different messages, and so that part was intense. But um, that was probably the the most like the most intense part of the whole trip, which is kind of being in the middle of all of that at the end. Yeah, I wonder if they had the same amount of protesters at the RNC. Yeah, I don't know. I wonder. I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. So that was that was my time. That that's my brain dump. And now wow. I got to consolidate all these thoughts and make official, like, full-on boom. Like, here's yeah. everything, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you made it back. Your flight back, hopefully, was smoother. It was it was smoother. Yes, Good. it was smoother. Uh, well, only, a, only a small half-hour delay. So yeah, I hope Sarah laid hands on you when you walked in the door to cast out I had to lay hands on rats. her. 
the poor girl was with two kids for five days by herself. She's an amazing wife. Like wow. I don't deserve her, but I was like, you know what? Dinner, dinner tonight out. Like let's get the kids taken care of. Like mm. you need some you time. So, um, wow, good of you. Th- th- I try, you know, um, before we leave, I do want to mention this again, cause tickets are selling fast. We are doing an in-person event. We're doing our, well, I'm doing it April. You can't make this one, but but we're doing our first ever in-person conversation. We're going to record it for YouTube. Um, with Representative James Tallarico, Democracy at Risk at Austin Seminary, September 23rd. I'll put a link in the show notes. All the details are there. Tickets are only $10, and the event is almost sold out. So I recommend picking up a ticket. Find me in Austin. We'll have a great conversation. James Tallarico is awesome. I love his work. My interview with him has like 60,000 views on YouTube, which is just mind-blowing to me. Nice. So, yeah, it's been doing really well. So we're going to do an in-person event. So don't forget that, friends. And, of course, I want to say don't forget to like this video if you really enjoy it and subscribe to the channel. April, it's kind of crazy that we have tripled our subscriber base in the past like three or four months like i am just blown away and humbled by that and i gotta say i love making content for youtube this is a very fun medium for me and i love the long form content so it's been a lot of fun it's been fun i'm glad you uh, asked me to join you on this me too. quest me too. <laughs> <laughs> and of course we're coming back this friday with our usual recap of the week so we'll have all that for you in just a few days friends thanks so much for watching we'll talk to you all later on see ya bye Finish. Thank you.